If you want to, we can do what we did yesterday, and let, uh, since we're in Wolf Hall, let out a wolf howl to wake up the people downstairs, so, uh, wait, in case there's anybody still sleeping in the building. And, uh, we'll have to make that a tradition, a wolf, wolf hall. Okay, uh, my topic uh, for this lecture is um, the curse of economic nationalism, and I've, I've written three or four books about this. doesn't necessarily mean I'm a big expert on it, but it's, it's one of my interests. And, uh, you know, my book, uh, Hamilton's Curse, uh, the reason I chose that title is that, uh, you know, this one, this one here, I might as well put it up there. No, that's not a good one. The reason I chose that title is there's a book by uh, uh, histor business historian John Steele Gordon called Hamilton's Blessing. And Alexander Hamilton once said that a large public debt would be a, a public blessing. And so that's why I chose one. Well, no, I said, no, it's a curse, not a blessing, <laughs> but a curse. And, uh, but Hamilton's, uh, the reason he said that is to give you a little background on what economic nationalism is. And, and Hamilton is the, the, the godfather of so-called economic nationalism in America. And many other countries have, have copied um, you know, what he stood for, the ideas, the policies, and so forth. So this is not just an American history thing. Uh, but, uh, and so, so he's, he's the godfather of the economic nationalism. And, um, and so anyway, what I'm going to start with is uh, uh, President Trump, um, when he, uh, one of the first speeches he made about economics, he chose to go to Louisville, Kentucky, to give his big speech on, on economics. And so his big speech. And what's the speech about? Well, here's one of the things he said in this speech. This was on um, March 20th. 2017 in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Henry Clay believed in what he called the American system and proposed tariffs to protect American industry and finance American infrastructure. And so he was there in Louisville because Henry Clay was from Kentucky. Henry Clay was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, member of Congress, Secretary of War, and he was, he was a well-known politician in the early 19th century. He basically was in politics from, I think, 1911 until he died in 18, or 1811, rather, until he died in 1852. Okay, and so, so Trump, uh, at least one of his speech makers, or, or his economic advisors, apparently convinced him that his economic agenda should be economic nationalism in the spirit of Henry Clay. And I doubt that Trump himself knew anything at all about Henry Clay, Henry Clay <laughs> before that, before somebody told him, hey, let's do this, let's, let's do this. And so anyway, uh, I want to give you some background. Henry Clay, um, is, he's, he's not the father of uh, economic nationalism, it was Hamilton. But uh, after Hamilton died, Henry Clay picked up the mantle. Uh, Hamilton died in 1804 in a, in a duel with Aaron Burr. <laughs> and uh, our friend uh, Gary North, uh, once said that he started an Aaron Burr Society once and they had ball caps and on the back of the ball cap it said, not soon enough. And Aaron Burr <laughs> shot Hamilton dead in, a, in the duel. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so he wasn't a fan of Hamilton. Okay. And, and neither was Murray Rothbard uh, as far as that goes. So, so what was this economic nationalism? Is that the word itself is deceiving because it implies that if it's nationalism, that everyone in the nation would benefit from this. Uh, but it's actually, it's exactly the opposite. It, it was always a collection of policies that would bear, uh, benefit a, a very narrow group of special interests at the expense of everybody else, okay? Economic nationalism. And the, the group of interests, it, it was really another word for mercantilism. And Murray Rothbard, one of his simple definitions of mercantilism was a collection of policies that benefits producers at the expense of consumers. That's basically what it, what it, what it was. It was in, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century in Europe and in, parts, in the United States eventually. Uh, that was mercantilism. And mercantilism is the system that Adam Smith sought to debunk in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations. The whole book is a, is a critique of mercantilism, which was the prevailing interventionist, corrupt interventionist system of England at the time. And that's why, why he wrote the book. And here's what Murray Rothbard said about uh, the gang in America, the Hamilton gang. Uh, uh, Patrick Newman yesterday mentioned... Uh, 
uh, a man named Robert Morris. Robert Morris was the first Treasury Secretary, even before they called the job Treasury Secretary. I think they called it Superintendent of Finance during the American Revolution. And he was one of the wealthiest men in America. He was uh, well connected with the whole, the New York, Boston, Philadelphia business class of, of wealthy people. And uh, he picked Alexander Hamilton as his front man in politics. And here's what Rothbard said was their objective, the objective of the nationalists who were, who were, who were their political party was the Federalist Party. So what they wanted was, and Rothbard says this in uh, his book, The Mystery of Banking, wanted, quote, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. Okay, and then in the next part, Rothbard says, an important part of what he called the Morris Scheme, as, as Rothbard called it, was to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself and his allies. The Bank of North America, which was the first government national bank in the U.S., uh, was deliberately modeled after the Bank of England. And so that was the agenda. It was always the agenda. That was the economic nationalist agenda, protectionism, what we today call corporate welfare, uh, supposedly for road and canal building, and then later railroad building when railroads came along, uh, a large public debt in a, in, a, in a bank run by politicians to provide cheap credit to, to uh, politically connected businesses. Not to provide cheap credit to everybody, only your political supporters. You don't want to provide cheap credit to businesses who are going to vote against the, op the opposing party. You want, you're going to provide cheap credit to the, the businesses that support your party. And that's what it, what it was for. Okay, and as far as Hamilton's uh, uh, blessing, the, the uh, public blessing, he was very Machiavellian about that. And the reason he gave for this, uh, of a big public debt, was not that we needed to borrow a lot of money to build roads or infrastructure or anything like that, but a, a public debt for the sake of having a big public debt uh, is what he wanted because he said that the affluent and the wealthy people of the country would own most of the bonds, the government bonds, and therefore they would form a potent lobbying force for bigger government and higher taxes to make sure that there would be, always be enough money in the treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds. Because Hamilton had, co he had condemned the U.S. Constitution. He called it a frail and worthless fabric after it was ratified and because it didn't make government big enough. It made it bigger and more powerful than the Articles of Confederation, but he wanted it much bigger. Yeah, much bigger, and so uh, and so his scheme to make it much bigger, bigger outside of the Constitution, was public debt. The connection with with the public debt, and he would spend the rest of his life uh, after the Constitution was ratified, uh, thinking of ways uh, to undermine the U.S. Constitution. He he's the one who invented the idea of implied powers of the Constitution, as opposed to the delegated powers that are actually in the Constitution. It was it was Hamilton and his debate over the bank with Jefferson who invented that. Okay, so that that's the that's the genesis of econ what's known as economic uh, nationalism. Is where it comes from. And so let me look at some of the elements I'll give you of why I call it a curse, why I call this whole agenda a, a curse, is that, uh, well, take a, let's take a look at the bank. The, the first bank, a government-run bank, was called the Bank of North America. It, it only lasted about a year or so because it inflated its currency so much uh, and had so little gold reserves behind it that no one trusted the currency and it just became defunct. It had to be privatized after about a year. And that, and that was Robert Morris. That was his idea, uh, Robert Morris. And, uh, and Murray Rothbard called Hamilton Morris's young disciple. Well, he's, he's a young disciple. And so Morris uh, failed there. And then they turned right around and started lobbying for 
uh, the same thing, basically, but with a different name, the Bank of the United States. And so, we, uh, and so they succeeded in getting the Bank of the United States. Uh, George Washington invited uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson to both give, give him their opinions on the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. Uh, Jefferson said it's unconstitutional because it's not in the delegated powers. Hamilton said, if you read between the lines of the Constitution, it is constitutional because there are implied powers. And Jefferson came back and said, I've read between the lines and it's all blank space. I don't see that. Don't... He didn't say that exactly. Those are my words, but that's pretty much the gist of his argument. And then, uh, but Hamilton uh, relied on uh, the necessary and proper clause of the United States Constitution that says, you know, the delegated powers are all listed there. And then it says the government has the power to do what's necessary and proper to, to execute all these delegated powers. And uh, Hamilton said, well, it's necessary to have a bank run by politicians to do all this. Uh, Hamilton, or Jefferson came back and said, it's not necessary, it's just convenient. We have banks. You know, the government could put its money, tax money in banks. We don't need a government bank to run it. But anyway, George Washington uh, signed the legislation. And the story goes, well, what really convinced him was not the brilliance of Alexander Hamilton, but what convinced him was he had purchased a lot of land in Virginia near Washington, near what is now Washington, D.C., Mount Vernon. And uh, they were in the process of moving the capital from New York to Virginia to create Washington, D.C. And George Washington said, if you, if you uh, extend the boundary of D.C. over to adjacent to my property in Mount Vernon, I will sign the legislation for your bank, he told the Federalists. And so he did. And so he got... Uh, he was a big real estate speculator, George Washington uh, was. Okay, so we got the first, the first bank of the United States, and the Jeffersonians had been arguing, well, this is going to create price inflation, it's going to corrupt politics, and it did. And it did, it did exactly everything, uh, everything they said it, uh, it would do. It created 72% price inflation in the first five years, uh, just as suspected. And here's what uh, Rothbard said about it, about the first bank of the United States. The bank of the United States promptly fulfilled its inflationary potential by issuing millions of dollars in paper money and demand deposits, pyramiding on top of $2 million in specie, gold and silver. The bank invested heavily in loans to the United States government, in addition to $2 million invested in the assumption of pre-existing long-term debt assumed by the new federal government, the bank engaged in massive temporary lending to the government, which reached 6.2 million by 1796. The result of the outpouring of credit and paper money by the new Bank of the United States was an increase in prices of 72% from 1791 to 1796. So it came into being in 1791. There was a 20 year charter and the, the United States Congress did not renew the charter because for these reasons, it, it, created, it created price inflation, it created boom and bust cycles, and, and it corrupted politics. Uh, eventually, what it would do would uh, give cheap loans to, to uh, politicians who promised to support uh, the continued funding of the Bank of the United States. Daniel Webster was on the retainer uh, as a lawyer for the Bank of the United States, and he threatened to... Uh, to leave and no longer represent the Bank of the United States unless they gave him his retainer. And uh, I quote a, a letter from him in, uh, in, one, in one of my books. And so that's what it was like. And so, but then what happened was uh, the War of 1812, instigated by Henry Clay, he was the main war hawk uh, for the War of 1812. And it's, it's, it's amazing to read when you read this history and, and you see how the American historians twist and, and spin history. Uh, Henry Clay was one of the main war hawks who wanted uh, the War of 1812. He thought it would be a cakewalk. He said, he said the Kentucky militia alone could take over Canada. And, and they wanted to conquer Canada. They wanted to make Canada a, a state, an American, American state. Okay. And so blame him for the war. Not only him, but him He's for the war. But then uh, the, the biographies of Henry Clay, at the end of the war, he was in a member of the committee that uh, negotiated the treaty with the British, and they give him uh, high praise 
for being a great compromiser. And they gave him the name, the great compromiser, because he, he compromised with the British, he was part of the committee, to end the war. So they don't blame him for starting the war, but they praise him for ending the war. So anyway, that's, so when you, if you read this history, you've got to keep an eye out for this sort of contradictions here, that they're, because they're everywhere. It's been my experience in reading these uh, hagiographies uh, of these people. So the Bank of the United States went defunct, but then, after the war, it, they were, uh, the politicians were persuaded to bring it back to monetize the debt to help pay the war debt. So, so it was brought back into existence in, with legislation in the year 1816 and came into operation in January of 1817. And who remembers the, uh, the title of Murray Rothbard's dissertation? The Panic of 1819. So, so the, bank, the bank is brought back into existence in January of 1817 and, and promptly creates the Panic of 1819, you know, just as the Jeffersonians always said it would. And I'll, I'll, read, I'll read you from Rothbard again. Let's see. Uh, 68. Uh, here's what uh, uh, Murray said about this. says, um, the Bank of the United States precipitated the Panic of 1819, the first um, economic depression in the new country, by a, by a series of deflationary moves, which sharply limited and contracted the loans and note issues of the bank branches. That was after their inflationary moves when they printed money to monetize uh, the debt. And so he clearly made the connection in his book between the uh, the, the recreation of the Bank of the United States and the Panic of 1819. And he also, also goes on to say this was the first time in American history where there was large-scale unemployment in the cities. Uh, and he points out that, like, in Philadelphia alone, the, the number of people employed in small manufacturing went, I think, from, from 9,500 people to 2,500 people. That's a pretty big uh, decline in employment in one year in the city of Philadelphia uh, I mean, during the Panic of 1819, okay? And so uh, they, it was given another 20-year charter in, in beginning and operating in 1817. So you fast forward, went to the days when Andrew Jackson becomes president, and Andrew Jackson is president, and he had a big pitched battle with the, the Bank of the United States, and he ended up uh, not renewing the charter. Not, he vetoed the renewal of the charter of the Bank of the United States, even though by that time the Bank of the United States had accumulated all these special interests, all the Hamiltonian interests, the big business interests from New York, Philadelphia, and, and uh, 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 Boston, New England, uh, but he defeated them. He defeated them. He had a lot of help, but he finally defeated them, and by vetoing this. And his veto statement, which is online, is uh, is quite remarkable. Uh, if you read uh, in Murray Rothbard's History of Money and Banking in, in the United States, one of the students yesterday asked me about Andrew Jackson, what I thought of Andrew Jackson. In, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> there's, uh, well, what I think of Andrew Jackson. Well, as a young man in the military, he was ordered to murder Seminole Indians, so he did that. And then in the military, he was ordered to uh, administer the, the Trail of Tears, forcing the, uh, the Cherokee Indians to walk to Oklahoma from North Carolina. And so uh, he was no saint, but I, I praise him for vetoing the Bank of the United States. That's a good thing that he did. So you don't have to say that uh, Andrew Jackson is my God to, to praise him, say he did a couple of good things and a lot of bad things. So, you, know, you know, who among you uh, cannot say that about yourself, you know, you know as, as far as that goes. But every time I've written something where I would praise Andrew Jackson for vetoing the bank, I'd get bombarded with emails. But he killed the Seminole Indians. You know, you know, he did all these horrible things. You know, he he, he kicked small children. You know, and, and all this. You know, so what? So what? And but but <laughs> but uh, but uh, who cares? Uh, you know. And, and of course, all these people who write me have never committed a sin in their lives. They're, 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 they're angels. They're all perfect angels, uh, otherwise known as libertarian purists, who, who Murray Rothbard did not like, by the way. Uh, and so, so anyway, uh, so Jackson did do that. He had a lot of help. He had help from the people of Ohio, too. Uh, the, Ohio, the Bank of the United States opened up two branches in the state of Ohio, and uh, the state of Ohio did not want 
this bank run by politicians messing with their society and their politics and their economy. So they imposed a $50,000 per year tax per branch. This is in the 1830s on, the, on the, the Bank of the United States, and they refused to pay the tax. And so the governor of Ohio uh, sent armed marshals into the bank vaults uh, and, and, and scooped up the money and put it into big chests and carried it, carried it off. And, and so it was not just uh, Andrew Jackson by himself. There were people in the states around the country that did not want this, uh, this government-run bank. It was, it was a menace. They knew it was a menace. And, and so he had a lot of help there. But his statement uh, that, that I, I was going to mention, if you read uh, Mur the, the section of Murray's book on the, the monetary history of the United States, has a little section on the Jacksonians. And a student yesterday asked me about Jackson, and I told her, well, for a, a brief introduction to who the Jacksonians were, read that 10 pages or so in the monetary history of the United States, because it was the Jacksonians were libertarians, uh, Murray Rothbard said. Not necessarily Jackson himself, but the Jacksonians. The people, you know, he, the, he founded the Democratic Party of the 19th century in the US. Okay. <laughs> So, so where is Jackson? He's page 72. He said this when he vetoed the Bank of the United States. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talents, of education, and of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions, but every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, exclusive privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors, meaning government favors, to themselves, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. If government would confine itself to equal protection of the law, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, that is to recharter the Bank of the United States, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. So that was a very libertarian statement there, saying that the central bank is a bank that basically grants exclusive privileges to the already rich and powerful at the expense of the rest of the country. And so, and this is why, uh, after I read that uh, years ago, I, I, uh, I wondered, uh, well, what does the history profession, the American history profession, think of this? They hate it. They hate. They call them a country bumpkin and ignoramus, and you know, and all this. They call them names, and, and for not every single historian, but the ones I looked up, they is sort of the, the the general thinking is this was an awful statement. But but I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. It's. Uh, I don't even know if Jackson wrote it. You know, they all had speechwriters uh, even back then, but uh, it was a very libertarian statement in vetoing the bank, of the United States. Okay, so that's one reason why I think uh, the the economic nationalism has always been a curse. That's the the first peg of economic nationalism is a central bank, and, and of course you, you've heard a lot more about central banks uh, this week already. The tariff, protectionist tariff. How many of you have ever heard of? Uh, the infant industry argument for protectionism. Does that, does that ring a bell? So, tell me about, raise your hand, about, looks like about, yeah, maybe about half, possibly, of the infant industry. Well, that too came from Alexander Hamilton. He argued that uh, the new industries had to be protected with tariffs, uh, or else they would never be able to compete. And so it was called the infant industry argument. And the, the even from his, in his time, uh, the argument against that was that, well, the infant industries never tend to grow up. And that, that certainly is true of the steel industry. The steel industry was protected almost from the very beginning with tariffs. Uh, certainly during the, uh, during the Civil War, when tariffs uh, went to an average of 50 to 60 percent, they were protected. All throughout the rest of the 19th century, the steel industry was protected. And fast forward to the election of George W. Bush as president, the very first thing he did in, in terms of economic policy was to impose new tariffs on steel. And so the, the infant steel industry, you know, that came about in the early 19th century is still being protected today, it's still being protected today. And so that was Hamilton's baby. And so a part of this cabal, the economic nationalists, of course, they, they wanted a bank they would provide them with cheap credit. They wanted to be protected from international competition with high tariffs. 
And in 1824, the year 1824, they thought they were in the catbird seat. They had, they had control of Congress, and they passed a tariff of 1824 that, that sharply increased tariffs from you know, the 10 or, 10 or 12 percent average rate to closer to 40 percent average rate. So there was a huge tariff, average tariff. You know, there, there are little, you know, I mean, I mean some, some, some goods had a 100% tariff and some had a 2% tariff, but the average, we're talking averages here, okay? And this was the first time where there was a clear separation between North and South in America on economic policy. The votes in the U.S. Congress for the 1824 protectionist tariff, and this was the first really big protectionist tariff in America, 104 votes from the northern states, three votes in favor from the southern states. In the Senate, the United States Senate, there were 25 yes votes from northern states, two from southern states. And so there was a very clear north-south distinction here. The, the north being the champions of protectionism, that's where the manufacturing was, what little manufacturing there was in, in 1824. That's where it was taking place in the north and the South was an agrarian society, and so they didn't see any benefit. You know, what were the tariffs on? The tariffs were on the manufactured goods uh, imported into America uh, so, so that the northern manufacturers would have less competition and can charge higher prices. And the southerners saw this as, uh, well, what's in it for us? We're, we're paying higher prices for, for everything. And, and on top of that, they complained for decades that most of the money, the revenue, was being spent in the North anyway. So they didn't see it uh, as very, very good for them at all. And also, since it was an agricultural society, uh, uh, the, the basic economics of it is that, of course, everybody would pay. You know, consumers in Massachusetts would pay more for farm tools and shoes, and consumers in Alabama would pay more for farm tools and shoes with higher tariffs on farm tools and shoes and blankets and clothes and things like that. But there was a secondary effect on, on farmers, not just southern farmers, but any farmers anywhere, <clears throat> that if, if we have protectionist tariffs and it impoverishes our trading partners in Europe, the Europeans have less, fewer dollars with which to purchase American exports. And what were they purchasing from Americans? Agricultural products, primarily. That's what the exports were from America to Europe primarily. And so the business, a lot of the business of the southern farmers dried up whenever there were, there were protectionist tariffs or Midwestern farmers or any, any other farmers in, in anywhere else. And so that, that's what they were complaining about right in 1824, right off the bat. And no one was talking about slavery or any of that stuff uh, in 1824. And so the, the economic nationalists were emboldened by this, and so in 1828, they passed an even bigger tariff, and, uh, and the Southerners called it the Tariff of Abominations. It was known as the Tariff of Abominations, and it increased the average rate to about 48%, and that's, uh, that uh, gave rise to the famous Ordinance of Nullification by South Carolina. The South Carolinians said, we're not going to collect this tariff at Charleston Harbor. This is, eight, this is the 1828 tariff, long before the Civil War or any of that stuff. Any of that stuff happened. And I'll read you a little bit about what this uh, ordinance of nullification said. I'll read from my own book. On November 19th, 1832, a political convention was convened that adopted an ordinance of nullification declaring the Tariff Act was, quote, unauthorized by the Constitution of the United States and violated the true meaning and intent thereof. It is therefore null void no law nor binding upon this state, its officers, or citizen. As of February 1, 1833, all enforcement of tariff collection in South Carolina is to be suspended. And, you know, the, the father of nullification was Jefferson and Madison, fathers. The, the, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of the year 1798, they nullified the Sedition Act which made uh, free political speech illegal in the, uh, by the, John, the uh, John Adams administration. And it was Jefferson and, and uh, Madison who wrote these resolutions saying, we're not going to enforce this law within our states, within Kentucky and Virginia. And uh, Jefferson was asked by a friend from Kentucky to write the resolution for Kentucky, even though he was a Virginian uh, himself. And so that, that's, that's the, uh, the genesis of nullification. 
And it, it was used all throughout the 19th century by states north and south. The state of Ohio nullified the existence of the Bank of the United States by doing what it did, uh, for example. And so the South Carolinians were serious. They even, they even gave the governor $160,000. This is 1832, $160,000 with which to purchase firearms to fend off federal tax collectors in case they came down and tried to enforce the tax. And, uh, and so, uh, and also part of the law said that any, any federal tax collector that showed up in South Carolina would, have, would be imprisoned and have his personal property confiscated that, that he had, whatever he had with him at the time, his, his, his money or whatever what he had with him. So they were serious. And, uh, and so, and so they nullified it. What ended up happening is they, cut, they had a compromised tariff, and over the next 10 years, the tariff rate was, was diminished from, uh, from the high rate of uh, 48% average, uh, uh, average. And so what, what happened was by the time you get to the year 1857, so this was 1832, you know, 25 years later, the average tariff rate in America was 15%, 1.5%. That was the, the high watermark of free trade in America in the 19th century. And, but the same cabal, the same gang, the economic nationalists were still there. The, and at this time, it was the Whig Party under Henry Clay, and then the Republican Party took that over. The Republican Party created in 1852 when the Whig Party disappeared, and the Republicans were now the champions of economic nationalism. And they took advantage of the, the depression of the year 1857 to say, well, what we need to cure the depression is protectionist tariffs. And so they got the ball rolling, and they ended up passing the moral tariff, <clears throat> named after a Pennsylvania uh, steel manufacturer, Justin Morrill. Not Pennsylvania, Vermont. I mean, Vermont, uh, I'm thinking of Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, and that was another, another creep uh, in, the, in the Republican <laughs> Party. Uh, so anyway, the, the, the moral tariff passed during the 1859-1860 Congress, cast the House of Representatives. This is before any southern state seceded or any of that. Lincoln was not elected president yet. So they, the House of Representatives passed that. And then the Senate passed it. And uh, President uh, Buchanan signed it two days before Abe Lincoln became president. So it was signed into law. It passed the Senate and signed by the previous president, Buchanan. Uh, two days before uh, Lincoln became president. Lincoln gives his first inaugural address, bends over backwards to promise not to, di not to disturb Southern slavery in his first inaugural address. Uh, he says over and over again, I have no intention to, to do this. And all my speeches, if you read all my past speeches, I've never said I had any intention. It would be unconstitutional for me to do it anyway. And then he supports in his first inaugural address something called the Corwin Amendment to the Constitution, named after an Ohio congressman named Corwin, that would have made it uh, pro prohibited the federal government from ever interfering in Southern slavery, the Corwin Amendment. And the Corwin Amendment had already passed uh, the House and Senate, and several states had already ratified the Corwin Amendment. Uh, to this. So, but, but on the issue of tariffs, Lincoln was totally uncompromising. He says in his first inaugural address, it is my duty to collect the duties and imposts, tariffs. And then he said, the next line is, but beyond that, there will be no invasion of any state. So he literally threatened a military invasion of the southern states over tariff collection. Unlike, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson was the president during the tariff of abominations. And uh, he didn't invade, but Lincoln did. Lincoln kept his word. Uh, because the southern states, when they seceded, they no longer intended to send money to Washington, D.C. Uh, they had their own government in uh, Richmond. Uh, and, so, but so he, and he used the words invasion and bloodshed in his first inaugural address to describe what would happen to any state, the people of any state that refused to continue to pay the, uh, the tariff, which had just been doubled two days earlier. So the rate of federal taxation was doubled two days earlier, and there was no income tax. The tariff was the main tax. that It raised over 90% of all federal revenue. And so Lincoln would uh, pass 10 tariff-increasing bills during his time, during his administration. So by the time you get to the end of uh, the Civil War, the American Civil War, the average tariff rate uh, was, around, was over 50%, 5-0. Five, five and it remained in that range, 50 to 60%, 
until the income tax came into being in the year 1913. So the whole latter part of the 19th century when the Republican Party had a monopoly in government. You know, even uh, uh, one book that I, I cite in my research, by, it's called Yankee Leviathan by Richard Benzel, B-E-N-S-E-L. He points out that uh, uh, he couldn't think of any other government in the world that had more monopoly power for a longer period of time than the Russian Bolsheviks or the Mexican government. Uh, and uh, if you look at it in history, you know, it's a monopoly government. And so that's what, so the, the economic and nationalists were finally in charge, finally in charge, and, 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 and they, they did what they always wanted to do since the time of Hamilton. But before that, president after president had failed to get this done. Uh, uh, one of the funnier episodes was when uh, the, uh, Henry Clay thought he finally had it made in the year 1840. They elected a Whig president, William Henry Harrison, and the Whigs controlled the Congress. They were ready to uh, go to town with high protectionist tariffs, bring the bank back, and, and start uh, in, uh, internal improvement subsidies. And then uh, William Henry Harrison, my favorite president, died a month after he was inaugurated, <laughs> which is a which of course is why he's my favorite president. And, uh, and so his vice president was John Tyler, who turned out to be a Jeffersonian, and he, he vetoed all this stuff. So they, they kicked John Tyler out of the Whig party and burned him in effigy in front of the White House. And they did everything, Henry Clay did everything but get down on his stomach and pound his arms and legs in front of the White House and scream like a baby over, over this. If you read the, the history of, of what happened, they kicked him out of his own party. And he's the president of the United States. A man without a party. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why, by the way, there's a book called Recarving Rushmore by Ivan Elin that ranks all the presidents in the United States according how good a job they did in protecting life, liberty, and property. And his number one president is John Tyler. He ranks number one of all the presidents. And the, the, who's, ever heard, who's ever heard of John Tyler, anyway? <laughs> Uh, that's why he was the he was the most libertarian of presidents. So, so therefore, he's a bad guy. You know, it's 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 all the people. Basically, the, when the historians rank presidents, it's mostly whoever kills the most people and raises the most tax. That's that, you know, Wilson, Roosevelt, Lincoln. That's that's those are all the the good guys. Okay, the third plank, which they finally got, also internal improvements. They had been arguing about that for since the days of Hamilton. Economic nationalism. That was part of Trump's speech in Louisville. Uh, yeah, infrastructure. Uh, well, Hamilton wanted that. Uh, Jefferson's uh, <coughs> Treasury Secretary also came out, Albert Gallatin, with a plan for this. Uh, but Jefferson said it's, you'd have to amend the Constitution first to do this, so they didn't do it. John Quincy Adams, when he was president, uh, he said uh, after he was president, his biggest failure was they didn't spend any federal money on uh, internal improvements. James Madison, when he was president, the last, his last day in office, the last thing he did was to veto a spending bill that included internal improvement subsidies on it. Andrew Jackson opposed that when he was president, you know, up to 1830. And then uh, I just told you the story about 1840, so they didn't get it then either. So you, by the time you get to the American Civil War period, uh, there was almost no money, federal money, spent on any of these internal improvements, roads, canals, and railroads at all. And some of the states had toyed with this, but it was such a disaster, such a boondoggle, so much corruption, that every state except of Massachusetts had amended its constitution by 1860 to prohibit the use of tax dollars for anything any corporation did. It was not just illegal, but unconstitutional by state constitutions because they had had such a horrible experience with all this. Okay, so you get to the Civil War, the Southern Democrats, who had always been the, the primary uh, uh, opponents of all this, were gone. They were gone. And the Whigs were in, in control. But they're, now they're called Republicans. And so uh, the war is on. April of 1861, the war starts. June of 1861, Abe Lincoln calls Congress back to Washington, D.C. You know, all those New England Yankees who were up there uh, in, back in Boston had to get back on the horse and go, go back to Washington, D.C. because there's an urgent matter to attend to, okay? There's a 60,000-man army in Manassas, Virginia. What's the urgent matter? Getting the Pacific Railway Bill passed. That's why they were called back. That's why they're called back. 
I mean, there's a 60,000 60, man Confederate army in Virginia amassing. And here's Congress say, well, we've got to get the legislation started to subsidize the transcontinental railroads, which they did, which they did. And, uh, and so that was uh, definitely high on the agenda. So they did, they, they, they began subsidizing the transcontinental railroads. Lincoln himself had purchased uh, some tracts of land in Council, Buff, Council Bluffs, Iowa uh, in 1857. And when they passed the Pacific Railway Bill, it gave the president the right to determine where they would start building the Transcontinental Railroad to California. Anyone want to take a wild guess where Abe Lincoln chose to start building the Transcontinental Railroad? At Council Bluffs, Iowa, of course. So he must have made a killing on that real estate deal there, as did all the, the luminaries of uh, the Republican Party. And uh, I'll read you just one short passage about this. Uh, let's see. Yes, 112. There's, a, there's a, a historian of the American West. There's a man named D. Brown who's, who's passed away a few years ago, but he was uh, the historian of the American West. He wrote all these books about the, the American Indians and the, the, the whole the history of the American West. And one of his books is called Hear That Lonesome Whistle Blow about the building of the transcontinental railroads. Okay, And here's one of the things he said. He said, when Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Bill, he assured the fortunes of a dynasty of American families, the Brewsters, the Bushnells, Olcotts, Harkers, Harrisons, Trowbridges, Cornells. He goes on and on, he names all these families. And then he talks about the, uh, the big shots in the Republican Party. Uh, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens received a block of Union Pacific stock in exchange for his vote for the subsidies. He also demanded, as a condition of his yes vote, uh, the insertion of a clause in the law requiring that all iron used in the construction of said railroad to be American manufacturer. He was an iron manufacturer from Pennsylvania. And, uh, Republican Congressman Oakes Ames, who with his brother Oliver manufactured shovels in Massachusetts, became a loyal ally of the Union Pacific Railroad and helped to pressure the 1864 Pacific Railway Act through the Congress. And, you know, and he was a shovel manufacturer. And it must have taken a hell of a lot of shovels to, to dig out the railroad tracks from Iowa to California. And so, so the, a lot of the members of Congress in the Republican Party became enormously wealthy uh, from this. And so they finally got their way. And this promptly created the, um, the biggest uh, political corruption scandal in American history up to that point. It was, it was called the Credit Mobilier Scandal. And that was the name of a, of a company. Kind of a, a French word. A Credit Mobilier uh, scandal. Where they set up this company, the Credit Mobilier. I'm not sure where that word, that phrase comes from, the title comes from. And they, they would do such things as, uh, you know, they, they were getting government money. And so to build the railroad, and then the, this company would supply them with rails, iron rails, and the ties, and things like that. And, and they would sell them to themselves at grossly inflated prices. Uh, and, and they would also buy the votes of members of Congress by giving them shares of stock for, say, $5, $5 a share. And then within a couple of weeks, uh, when the flood of uh, tax dollars went into the company, the shares would be worth $100. And so he had all these members of Congress who became instantly millionaires uh, through all this. And it finally was exposed. One of the members of this, of this scam apparently got ticked off at another member of the scam over something. And he went to a reporter and he gave the reporter the names of all the members of Congress who had been given the $5 a share stock. And the whole thing blew up and the whole country knew about this. And, and, uh, and a lot of people went to jail uh, for it exactly the type of thing that Jeffersonians always argued about, that uh, the curse of economic nationalism, that this, it would lead to rampant corruption, waste of tax dollars, inefficiency in the building. And the, the two railroads that the government built, uh, you know, at the time they declared that they were finished with the job, they were both bankrupt. And, uh, and the great James J. Hill came along and built the Great Northern Railroad at the same time with no government subsidies at all, and it was the most profitable and most efficient railroad uh, by far. And uh, I have about one minute left here. 
And this is basically what happened with the, the transcontinental railroads. Like, this is my map of the United States. Here's, here's the United States. Here's, here's Iowa. Here's, a, here's Lincoln's property. I'll put a picture of Lincoln here. Here's Abe Lincoln. He's happy. He's a big smile because he made so much money on that, on that property. And the railroad line of the, uh, the government subsidized railroad lines looks kind of like this. They're in California. Because in return, in return for congressional votes, uh, or even support by the territories, the politicians in the territories, they had to promise to run a separate line to your community in return for your vote. Okay, so they did that. James J. Hill's line was very different. The Great Northern. And my, here's another map. Here's my map of the United States. Okay. Okay. Here's Lincoln again. Here's Abe Lincoln. His was more like that. And, uh, and if I had more time, and I've, I talk about this in my classes sometimes, I actually put up on the computer, there is, you can find the map of the Great Northern Route uh, or, and the Union Pacific Route. And they really do look like the spaghetti thing that I just I drew on here. And because James J. Hill was a private entrepreneur, unsubsidized, he didn't even get land grants. He, he paid for the rights away through the Indian Territory with cattle or whatever they could trade for. And of course, his objective was the most efficient, shortest route to the West Coast because that's the most profitable. And so, and so he did. And uh, I happened to be in, uh, in uh, Montana, northern Montana, a couple summers ago. And I went to a restaurant. They had a second floor uh, bar. And went out to the se outside seating on the bar. I sit there, and there's a train track in front of it. And uh, right in front, on the side of the train, it said Great Northern, the Great Northern Railway. It's still there. Still, still, still operating in Montana, and so. But he, but uh, James J. Hill was. It, it's thought that uh, he was one of the characters in Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged. That James J. Hill is uh, what one of them is, is patterned after. So anyway, that's that's my uh, uh, truncated story about the curse of economic nationalism, how it came to America, and of course, once this scam was proven to be uh, a recipe for accumulating great wealth and power, governments all over the world uh, uh, have ever since uh, imitated it. And they've also recruited intellectuals like Trump has to tell stories about how wonderful this is and to try to make people think that, that uh, a set of government policies that benefits politically connected business people at the expense of you is really in your best interest, that you really should support that and vote for that. Yeah, but if you understand a little bit about uh, elementary economics, you won't be fooled by this. Uh, this uh, scam of economic nationalism. And that's all I'm gonna do for now, and you can let off one more howl, wolf's howl if you want. Uh, so, okay. and, and that's it. <laughs>